That's it. We're live. Reinhard Stelter, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, the excitement <laughs> is on my side as well. Well, then we're both excited. That's uh, an excellent foundation for a good creative dialogue. Um, and that is really what this is and what your work is about. And that's uh, why I'm particularly excited about uh, opening this conversation and uh, your work up to our audience. Because I, uh, obviously, as, as part of a coach training school and as part of uh, uh, teaching coaches, often we start with a first generation coaching approach. And at Animus, there's a lot around transformational coaching. So I think we have embedded already um, further um, generations of coaching into the way that we teach. Mm. But I think when coaches are starting out, very often it is quite goal oriented and it is mm. solution focused. And it often is quite structured because this kind of structure offers certainty and safety of what we're doing as coaches and also for our clients. Mm, but yeah, as right. coaches mature, I think it's almost inevitable that these doors into the third generation of coaching open and this is very much where your most recent work is situated and you've been writing about this for quite some time uh, most notably around the guide to third generation coaching and more recently the art of dialogue uh, in coaching which I really appreciated recently learning that the original title you had in mind uh, was the the art of lingering uh, yeah, right. in German we're both German so uh, yeah. you know there's something around the language I'm going to be super curious about that because I also think coaching is such a valuable space to linger, to create mm. some space, to uh, as a reflective space for yes, our clients. Right. So I, that's what I wanted to open up with you and uh, that's why I'm excited to talk to you about. Perhaps what we could start with is just a little bit of your story. It helps to know who, where are you talking from? Who are we talking to? So could you tell us a little bit about what got you into coaching and maybe mm -hmm. um, you, you come from sports originally. Yeah, right. It would be yeah, great I, to hear a bit of yeah, your story. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've been working at the department of, uh, now the name is uh, Nutrition, Sport and Exercise at the University of Copenhagen. And um, I think it was in the end of the uh, last century I was asked to teach on a course with, which had the title Coaching and Team Development. And, um, you know, I, my background is also in psychotherapy. So I have an education in psychotherapy and I have a PhD in psychology. So I actually was asked, the course was led by another person before who was more performance oriented uh, uh, in, the, in his uh, view of coaching. And, uh, but I had actually no real clear idea. So what is special about coaching? So that was my starting point. And my PhD was on identity development. Uh, so I thought this is one foundation. And the other theoretical framework was actually learning theories. So mm -hmm. I thought this combination was a good starting point for for creating my my course, and um, and I actually had a, a written a book uh, uh, which was a more a handbook uh, in Danish about uh, sports psychology, and the publisher asked me, so now you have written a very, very theoretical book, so why not could could you just think about writing something which is more applied and. I think they should have thought about something like mental training, uh, so which is very much it appeals to, to, to sport uh, performance. And I said, no, I don't want to uh, this, uh, but I think about what, what I can find out. So, and that was actually my starting point into coaching. Huh. Uh, I uh, wrote a, my first book together with some other people, uh, in, uh, which was published in uh, 2002 which had the title translated coaching, learning and developing. Mm -hmm. And this was really actually um, a bestseller because at this mm -hmm. time in, 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 in the, uh, on the Danish market, there was one other book on coaching, which was the, the Whitmore's probably, you know? Yeah. Right. Coaching for performance. So, yeah. Right. That, that was the, the other only book. And I mean, we know what, what this book was like. It was more, you know, like a guru, a, 
uh, oriented <laughs> book. So that's the way how I do it. It was not very theoretical anchored. It was a book really for practitioners. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that brought me uh, into it. And, uh, you know, I developed, I uh, visited uh, different courses and, and so on and so on. And then I started to write uh, two, two other books. And these books are translated to, uh, to English, which you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. So and uh, now recently this year I published a, a new book which uh, has uh, which is a kind of summary book. Uh, the title is "Coaching Short and Good." If I can. <laughs> <laughs> pointy, <laughs> yeah, so so it's a book you know if you want to really maybe include yourself in a coaching uh, work or if you just want to have a brush up uh, what coaching is about. Mm -hmm. This is. Is the book is the book short and good, or is it about uh, coaching yeah, that is short and good? It's it's uh, it's the book which is uh, only one hundred fifty pages, and ah. so that's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I take a step back for a moment? Yeah. I'm wondering, um, as you were working in sports already, you mentioned identity, you mentioned dialogue, you mentioned uh, um, having a different kind of conversation that isn't so uh, performance and goals oriented. I wonder, did you already do that with uh, in, in the sports sector or is that something that you developed out of? Yeah, I mean, that's my other leg, uh, so to say that for the last 12 years, I work on a, a program of, uh, at the Copenhagen Business School, which is a program for public leaders. So that it's a master of public governance. And mm -hmm. here I actually tried also to broaden the perspective of what coaching could be, because, you know, often leaders are getting interested in coaching, but they will never be The, the coach in the or, uh, original sense, because I mean, every, t uh, every uh, leader has uh, her own ad agenda. And, uh, and if you are a coach, you shouldn't have an agenda on the, uh, on the background of your, your client. Yeah. So there is something different uh, in play uh, mm -hmm. here. And, uh, and here, I think we have to change the perspective. So in that mm -hmm. context, I actually leave out the title uh, of coaching, which I sometimes really also struggle with. So and I speak about transformative dialogues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love, let me jump in there. I love that you're mentioning that because there is a lot of work out there that teaches leaders coaching skills or coaching skills for managers. And it's a fantastic seller. Mm -hmm. And lots of leaders and managers already use the term coaching when they talk about uh, certain outcome focused conversations that they have. But when you look at coaching as that kind of dialogue where you are meeting your client at eye level and really you don't bring your own coaching, uh, your own agenda in, it's really difficult to bring those two together because when you are somebody's leader or somebody's manager, mm -hmm. when you are somebody's friend or somebody's partner or, you know, having some sort of dual relationship, it's difficult not to come in with an agenda. That's why it's so difficult to coach friends. And that's why it's so difficult for as a manager to coach one of your direct reports because there is something in there. So I'm, I was really happy to hear you being critical about that because I, I, it seems that it's something that a lot of people either don't understand or don't want to uh, bring into their awareness mm -hmm. because, you know, it's, it's arguably a good thing to teach people coaching skills because they're going to relate to people better. They're, they're going to be better listeners. They're going to be more aware of what's going on for them and for other people. Mm -hmm. But there is a conflict there. Yeah, right. So, and... Um... And, and there also, I really try to open up for a whole different area. And here I, I have actually two uh, colleagues whom I have worked with uh, uh, together with for, for more than a decade. Uh, one person is actually a, a theologist who, uh, who is an expert in Kierkegaard. Ah. Uh, so the existential philosopher, maybe one of well, the most, I'm a fan. <laughs> most famous uh, uh, Danes, uh, mm -hmm. if you see it broadly from a world perspective, I think only Hans Christian Andersen with his fairy tales is more famous. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very hard for Kierkegaard. Who, they were 
fellow uh, fellows in in the same t time living and um, it, i think it was quite hard for kierkegaard sometimes to see uh, hans christian andersen being famous and traveling all over the place and uh, he was not uh, uh, kierkegaard at that time he was not that famous so <laughs> they invoked a different kind of yeah. emotion in people yeah. <laughs> so and my other colleague is actually a, a, a colleague from uh, copenhagen business school who works with leadership philosophy mm -hmm. and he is very phenomenologically oriented and he has developed a kind of a phenomenal phenomenology of the event um, mm -hmm. and uh, here the perspective and he has reinvented actually a kind of spe specific form of dialogue and modified it uh, and we have further developed this in uh, in our teaching which is called protraptics and this is a very strange uh, word but it uh, goes actually back to aristotle who has written a book on this with this title and this was actually a, an introduction for a a king, a, a Greek king, to make the king aware about how to be a good leader. Ah, oh, fascinating. And, and uh, the thing was, uh, so the approach of protraptics, which is actually kind of, uh, you could translate it more as a value-oriented way of coaching or a dialogue on the basis of coaching uh, of value reflections mm -hmm. that would be uh, the the focus here yeah. so because the, the the basic idea is in in this protraptic or value reflective approach to dialogue is that you focus on specific values which somehow are the basis of your way of acting in the world but mm -hmm. you are not very aware of them so mm -hmm. if you really focus on specific uh, values then you come closer to uh, actually the way you you intend to act in the in the world mm, that so really it really resonates with me from i mean i'm coming from a positive psychology and from an existential perspective into coaching and one thing that is big in positive psychology is a strength approach and one of yeah, the right. the most popular strength assessment is the VIA which stands for values yeah. in action and yeah. it seems to come from the same premise that our values and our virtues guide our actions yeah. and that when we're in line with that we feel really authentic and we often perform at our best yeah, yeah and you you mentioned the word authentic this is actually quite interesting because normally people think authentic is that you really act the way like other people see you or you are really your, uh, yourself but it's actually the uh, if you go back to the uh, et etymology of the word it actually means that you act on the basis of your own authority hmm and how do you develop authority about uh, in the way you are acting? You do it on the basis of specific values. Mm -hmm. And so if you, for example, reflect on a more abstract and anonymous way so that you are not focusing directly on specific situations, but you reflect on what specific terms mean to you. So mm -hmm. uh, responsibility. So... Mm -hmm or freedom or um, yeah many many different uh, 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 values you can uh, think about and if you reflect on them on the very general basis you come into contact with something which you actually can talk uh, where you actually can use the word uh, 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 you, you just uh, present authentic yeah authentic mm -hmm. so that you are acting authentically on the basis of uh, mm -hmm. of specific values yeah in alignment with your values and your beliefs yeah right so it goes actually a bit uh, deeper than the, than in positive psychology because mm -hmm. the idea is really based on phenomenology uh, phenomenological thinking where you really find out when you 
when it, you 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 embody uh, these values and embodiment means actually that you then can also act uh, on the basis of them yeah in and and sorry situations. maybe just to explain in a nutshell phenomenology just means to dive into the essence of a phenomenon in this yeah. case for example a certain behavior or an experience it's yeah. the study of experience so when we take a phenomenological approach, we really try to explore whatever it is that is going on right at the moment and how our clients experience that. Yeah, right. And when we take a value perspective on that phenomenological exploration, we really dive into an exploration of what makes me do this thing that I'm doing, what yeah. makes me have this experience that I'm having right now. Yeah. And Probably the difference between uh, my colleague uh, uh, is, both of my colleagues, is probably that I try to combine this with a more relational social constructionist uh, approach. And here I really try to develop the relation, the coaching or the dialogue relationship in a new way that, that's, that I really try to yeah, include myself in the dialogue as a co-creative partner. Mm -hmm. So that I'm much more, my role or my position in the dialogue is more active in a way that I'm a co-reflecting partner. So I take mm -hmm. something up from what I've, what I've uh, have heard uh, from my dialogue partner. And here I really try to reflect on my own premises so when i hear something how do i sense this so i use my myself as a kind of uh, um, measurement you could say uh, uh, or a, a sensory uh, instrument uh, to to get a sense of what is meant by the other and reflect this on my own premises and I think often there is, you, you can build up a relationship which is much more intense in that way mm -hmm. that I really try to yeah, get in touch with the, and embark on the other. Mm -hmm. I really embark on the other and really get something out of it for my mm -hmm. own way of seeing the world and share this. And in mm -hmm. that sense, also try to develop something of a new understanding in my dialogue partner. Yeah. Could you make this come alive maybe with an example from your coaching work so that, uh, that uh, the audience can, can get a feeling for what might that look like when they're in the room with someone? So it, it could be a, a situation where I'm, you know, I, I'm presented with the, oh yeah, actually, Maybe I should take a situation which I just had today uh, in, a, in a, a dialogue. Um, I had a, a, a talk with a younger academic who wants to develop a kind of new style of developing in the organization. Mm -hmm. And here, I, it suddenly struck me and uh, how how this somehow uh, i mean this is a younger colleague and i'm a senior colleague and i i had a you know a kind of flashback to my first years in academia hmm. and here i presented a situation which reminded me on the struggle i had myself mm -hmm. and this she said afterwards in when we evaluated the 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 conversation uh, in the end she said oh, this was really interesting that you brought yourself into the dialogue because this gave me some kind of examples of how things felt for you and how it feels for me and how, where there are similarities and where there are differences. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, the English um, uh, uh, co uh, uh, colleague, uh, John Schotter, who died a couple of years ago, uh, he created a term which I think is somehow a guideline for my work. And uh, uh, John Schotter was also trying to 
combine a phenomenological approach with a social constructionist approach. And he used the term witness thinking or witness talk. And this is something which I really think fits to what my intention is, that I really, mm -hmm. and I use a metaphor here. The metaphor is that I sometimes, as the dialogue guide or the coach, I get a present from the other. And on the other hand, I'm able to give presents. So, and, and this interchange of receiving presents and giving presents, there's something where we can create something together and we co-create something new. We build a new narrative for uh, my dialogue partner. Mm -hmm. A presence here as a as gifts or yeah, gift. as being yeah, present. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, a, a gift here. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, uh, so this this sharing of gifts is uh, actually something yeah. which I really uh, try to focus on in in my work. And here you can see something which I describe as co-creative uh, dialogue really comes mm. into life where I. And the, I also speak here about moments of symmetry, mm -hmm. which is actually a forbidden territory in, uh, in coaching <laughs> yeah. uh, normally. But these yes. moments of symmetry, they create something new mm -hmm. in the dialogue. And, you know, you become human also yeah. as a, a, a dialogue guide. And I think this is important that, mm -hmm. that I'm not, you know, I'm not... Uh, without mistakes or without challenges, without struggles in my life. And I think sharing these struggles and these memories in this situation, it was a memory I, I was yeah. sh sharing. And I, I was also puzzled about that it came up. I mean, I haven't <laughs> thought about it for a very long time. I mean, it's a situation which is more than 30 years ago. Uh, so, yeah. And it came up. And it's, yeah. it seemed to be a similar struggle uh, my uh, dialogue uh, uh, partner was in. Yeah, that, that reminds me of uh, my work with one of my earliest coaches, where at some point he shared that, uh, he said, you remind me of myself when I was younger and shared some of his struggles as well. And just the self-disclosure was something that at that time was kind of new for me because in many coaching schools that's that's regarded as a no you don't you don't do that you don't bring yourself into that extent when actually there's a lot of practitioners out there who very much do that uh, yeah. and it creates a, a relationship a, a, cr a connection a resonance between two human beings yeah. that gets us to this level of dialogue at eye level But also there's a risk that perhaps we might be slipping into a mentoring relationship when that is being perceived by the by the client or by the, the dialogue partner as, oh, he is somebody who's more senior and who's uh, experienced something similar. Maybe there's something for me to learn from that person's experience. Yeah, but I think uh, also, I mean, I, I work also as a mentor uh, and... Uh, I started actually working as a mentor, which is a non-profit uh, activity. So I, I do it uh, for free at, at, at my university. Uh, and I think that there is not that great difference anymore than it used to be. And I, you can see it also. There are a lot of handbooks of mentoring and coaching psychology or uh, mm -hmm. so often handbooks combine uh, in their title uh, mentoring and coaching mm -hmm. and what is what is essential for for me uh, and maybe some in some way mentoring in this new format is more close to third generation coaching than other ways of uh, uh, coaching and mm -hmm. Mentoring, I define as a learning alliance. Mm -hmm. and, and actually coaching is also It's a learning, learning alliance. Yes, so, and therapy in a way is also a learning yeah. alliance. And this is why I, I really appreciate the term dialogue so much. I remember at some point me and Nick Bolton, um, who, who obviously runs the school, uh, 
we sat together in a bar and he mentioned the, the uh, term transformational dialogue. And at that time, I was thinking a lot about integration of coaching and therapy and mentoring and consulting and where's the line, where's the gray area. And clients tend to not really care what you call yourself when so many coaches, particularly so many practitioners are concerned, oh, what's the term for myself and what I do and dialogue seemed to for me to be a such a, an elegant solution to disregard those questions of what we do because mm -hmm. essentially we are in dialogue and as long as we practice within our competency and within our ethical and legal framework um, then it's a conversation in which yeah, right. two people partner or come together to uh, focused on what the client or the person who's seeking the dialogue uh, wants to figure out or achieve who they want to be or what they want to do. So I love the term dialogue for that. And it was a revelation, like it was wonderful to see your book and see that, uh, see a whole framework being built around that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You refer to that transformative dialogue. And I, I've seen also the subtitle of your book in English is transformative exchange. Yeah, um, right. I, I wonder if we maybe at this point, I know a lot of pe people who might be listening to this, we heard us talk about third generation and dialogue. Um, could we maybe just uh, sketch out the development of coaching? What's first, what's second generation? Maybe just in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when I wrote this book, which ended to have the title uh, in it, uh, Third Generation Coaching, it was actually... Um, you know, I, I tried to have a sketchy title. Uh, <laughs> sketchy. <laughs> so, and it actually goes back. I was invited to, to uh, uh, for a keynote, which is now 12 years ago, where I got the title from the organizers. And it was a big consultancy company in, in, in Denmark, or which is also internationally uh, anchored. And they gave me the title, coaching's landscape here and now mm -hmm. and i thought so what how shall i get a grip on on this issue because i mean you know there are so many different ways of coaching i mean it starts from parent coaching dog coaching sex coaching <laughs> health coaching spiritual health, coaching yeah. performance coaching uh, the list is endless yeah so uh, and I thought this is not a way to go. So what I actually tried was to go into the basic perspective of different ways of having a, con uh, a dialogue with a uh, in a coaching a coaching setting. Mm -hmm. The first <clears throat> generation is very much focused. The focus is very much on goals or really very specific problems. Mm -hmm. So, and here, you know, more, maybe the most famous uh, framework for first generation coaching is the GROW model. Very structured. You go uh, from one step to the next. And probably it's also a good model, as you said in the beginning. Maybe it's a good model to start uh, uh, off with. So you, you get some, some kind of uh, clear framework and you can help the person to, uh, to proceed to go closer to the goal. And I think this is also the approach of traditional sports coaching because, I mean, you want to be champion in four years and then you have, uh, uh, you, you build your goal setting up in uh, smaller goals for the next two months, for the next year, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's a the, the thinking is very l linear. Mm -hmm. So it's Although, one sp step to the next, and it's very causal, uh, causal, linear uh, oriented. Yeah. Although to be fair, I think the grow model is can be a lot more versatile and uh, be used in much more complex situations if we don't approach it as linear. I think it it can be a very simple, straightforward, uh, what you describe framework, but also it's difficult to not approach any form of change as where do you want to be and where are you now and yeah. what's the gap in between and how might we bridge that yeah but this is already i think 
there you already include something more. I, I think I, I came say. at the grow model with a particular third generation perspective. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. Okay. So if, I think if we go to the next uh, generation, <laughs> there uh, it's very much based on systemic thinking, solution oriented thinking, social constructionist uh, thinking. So where you actually uh, work somehow with a kind of uh, idea about possible futures. So mm -hmm. probably if, if I take solution focused perspective and maybe this magical question. So you go to bed tonight and uh, you, ha you have a conflict with your, uh, with, uh, your working partner. Uh, and uh, you wake the next morning and uh, the conflict is gone. How do you experience the day from the mo moment where this magical thing has happened? Mm -hmm. And you really go into it in a different way. So you build up a, a kind of understanding from uh, yeah, a feed forward position, you could say. So, mm -hmm. so there's something different here. Uh, and what you have just uh, said was actually something, a mixture of grow model and uh, second generation coaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I say, uh, speak about all these uh, uh, different uh, generations, you normally would combine them. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a third generation coach all the time through one conversation. Mm -hmm. So there are moments where I'm a first generation coach. There are moments mostly or very frequently i'm the second generation coach mm -hmm. but on the third generation uh, level you are this reflective partner and i think for example i mean third generation coaching is not a closed system mm -hmm. so when you work about uh, with uh, existential coaching it's a third generation coaching approach mm -hmm. You mentioned spiritual coaching. It would be in a third generation uh, approach. So there are many uh, ontological coaching, hermeneutical mm -hmm. coaching. So there are many different facets of this uh, third generation uh, approach where you really offer yourself uh, as a dialogue mm -hmm. guide in this reflective space uh, yeah. where you somehow try to find new perspectives where you include uh, 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 reflections where you learn something from the other where you share gifts mm -hmm. with each other and where you in that sense uh, create a co-reflective uh, mm -hmm. uh, dialogue yeah and often it's quite fluid uh, and coaching engagement might start with a particular goal that somebody comes in and 20 minutes two sessions later uh, you find yourself really having created a reflective space. So maybe the goal was reached and you still have a couple of sessions left and then you enter this reflective space. So uh, you might come back if a new specific goal emerges. So I think having the capacity to move between uh, different approaches and different lenses on the work uh, really serves the client super, super well, depending on what the context yeah, right. is. So and you, you mentioned the term trans, transformative exchange, and maybe we mm -hmm. could talk a bit about this uh, uh, for, for a while. I mean, this goes actually back to my starting point where I spoke about learning theories. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of, I mean, learning is something new uh, uh, or has become something new. And in, in the old days, there were actually two terms in, in Danish, um, uh, which I, it, it wouldn't help really to translate them. But one is, I mean, there are two, maybe two perspectives. There's this uh, black educational approach where, you know, you know, you fill another person with knowledge. Mm -hmm. You just, uh, you know, this submitting uh, your knowledge as a teacher to mm -hmm. a pupil who has just, get it into their, their system. Mm -hmm. Which sometimes so, it's extremely valuable. Some knowledge we just need to soak up. Yeah. But we are in a time where we actually really develop often knowledge very differently. And, you know, mm -hmm. all, also the old authorities, I mean, you can mm -hmm. start as parents. I mean, we have lost uh, our authority. And <laughs> now it really comes actually to, 
medical doctors. I mean, mm -hmm. people, scientists, people, scientists, and you know, people who really were authorities in the old days, mm -hmm. maybe just 20, 30 years ago, have mm -hmm. lost this authority. Mm -hmm. And in in the working space, a lot of things happen so rapidly mm -hmm. that the leader cannot provide this old school knowledge you just do it this way and then it works for you so yeah. learning has become a, a transformative act mm -hmm. so you and it also and this is what new learning theories tell uh, tell us about is that it always has an impact on your identity mm -hmm. so learning is now I mean, in the old days, you you got more or less an identity by birth from your <laughs> family background and so yeah. on. And now we really have to work on identity in our everyday life. I mean, it's much more fluid. Yeah, and uh, I mean, look at uh, younger people uh, being on social media. I mean, it's identity has become a performative act more mm -hmm. or less. Yeah. So you perform you perform identity. But here in, in a coaching uh, or in a transformative dialogue, I think identity is something, you know, fragile. You know, mm -hmm. people put themselves in a position where they are trying to experiment with something new. I mean, mm -hmm. they are in doubt what they are doing. And here, you know, this transformative aspects of identity development comes in and in that sense the learning becomes a transformative act mm -hmm. and very empowering we put people into a position where they can create their own identity through how they act and how they show up in the world so we're yeah. using this fluid space and offering yeah. people uh, an active um, component in, in creating who they are yeah Right. And if I mean, there, there we can go back to Kierkegaard, who actually says, and a lot of other dialogue philosophers like Martin Buber, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, you are only something through the other. Mm -hmm. And we take the role of the other mm -hmm. in, in a, co a coaching or transformative dialogue context. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to help the person find him or herself. In, <laughs> through the dialogue yeah and, and what a wonderful the, space in that exchange to be the yeah. person through which the other person defines themselves yeah. and bringing ourselves in uh, as an active inhabitant of you know that one-to-one -one relationship uh, offers a space where the other person can realize oh this is how i'm reacting to somebody else's criticism or to a, a different opinion mm. or somebody who's with the same opinion mm, right so in this process, and I think there it becomes more clear that my position as a dialogue guide or coach is the much more active part because I offer myself and my, you know, my sensing of the other and my, you know, embracing the other and the otherness of his being. I try in that sense to help the person to develop through my reflections on mm -hmm. what comes up as gifts I receive or as gifts I can give. Mm -hmm. I would love to pick you up on the term resonance at this point, because you, you wrote in your book and you talked about this as well, is that in this in this relationship, as we are in dialogue, as I'm sharing gifts or receiving gifts, that it really helps to be aligned, to resonate with each other. You mentioned uh, Rosa's work about resonance as well, and that has really influenced uh, a lot of what you what you wrote about. I, I was wondering, because sometimes when we are differently resonating, I would say, you know, resonating uh, where we don't meet, where we have differences in opinion, it's a huge learning opportunity so it's a complex topic but i wonder yeah, if you yeah. could if you could talk a little bit about it so that it we don't give the impression that we always have to be in alignment with our client in order to do excellent work that resonance can also be having different opinions yeah. i mean i actually use the term resonance in my uh, uh, book about uh, the, the art of dialogue and coaching 
So, uh, and this book was originally, uh, it's a uh, translation from Danish and the, uh, the Danish book was published in 2016. And it was actually the same year when Hartmut Rosa, the uh, German sociologist, came up with his book on uh, resonance. So I had no idea about <laughs> that he was working on it. I love that. Uh, and I, I just became curious. What is in, in his work which might be relevant for my understanding of, uh, of coaching? And he doesn't speak about at all about dialogue in that sense. So, uh, but uh, he has written something about acceleration, beschleunigung. Mm -hmm. uh, that was his major <laughs> work for, for his uh, prof professorial uh, habilitation uh, work. And he, he says, if acceleration is the problem, resonance might be the solution. So that is the baseline. Acceleration so, on a societal level in terms yeah, of... Yeah, you know, acceleration and, you know, technical changes, mm -hmm. social changes, personal yep. changes. So that, that was his work about that these three different domains of acceler acceleration mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, talking about. And then he was... And this is new for a critical sociologist that he actually offers a social sociology for the good, hmm. which is quite unusual for, mm -hmm. for a sociologist because they're normally very critical about society. And of mm -hmm. course, he is also critical. He says that our processes of alienation, uh, of alienation uh, in our society. And there he goes back to to the Frankfurt School of Sociology, uh, of course. But what he actually tries to investigate is what kind of spaces, uh, social spaces and natural spaces are for resonance. So he speaks about family, he speaks about nature experience. He starts actually to speak about the body, body as a kind of resonating partner. Uh, But funny enough, he doesn't speak about dialogue. And I thought, okay, I try to, to adapt some kind of uh, ways of thinking of, uh, in, in regard to resonance to my understanding of how uh, transformative dialogues and coaching can be uh, conducted and worked mm -hmm. with. And he uses actually at one point, which is maybe... Uh, simplification but he uses the the tuning fork that we are actually the tuning fork as coaches or dialogue uh, 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 guides we are the tuning fork of the other so you know <laughs> when when you put it when you put it uh, yeah smash uh, uh, or what, what, how would you say schlagen T tuning form is you um Yeah, you put them on on, on the. You, you it's kind of like a little triangle, but it has like it's shaped like a Y and it has yeah. a little dot and at you, the bottom. You, you put it on some it, wood, and yeah, then you, you can tune on, your instrument. And, and then you, you it, it starts to swing. And if mm -hmm. you hold another tuning fork beside it, it starts to swing in the same tune. Mm -hmm. And this idea, I mean, it's a simplification uh, somehow, but you are actually the tuning fork for your dialogue partner. Hmm. So, and of course, if you open this up a bit more, then I think one term which is really important is that you embark on the story of the other. You really, hmm. you go into it. You try to understand the life world of the, of the other. With, hmm. I mean, knowing that you never become part of, or you can, can never leave, uh, fully mm. grasp the complexity of the life work uh, of another, but you can relate to it. Mm -hmm. you, and I think being different mm -hmm. makes the development. So it's not the idea that I want to be the, uh, just offering, or I, I, I understand you from your perspective, but, you know, where you really struggle mm. and you, you know, you rub onto each other's positions and you highlight the differences. I think mm -hmm. this is some part of the resonance you are also need to adapt to. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just being on the same tune, but offering something 
which is somehow different, but you are inspired by the other. I think we might need yeah. to be a bit careful with a metaphor because yeah. from the sounds, if we take that tuning fork metaphor, it sounds like, well, I'm resonating, I'm giving out a certain uh, frequency. And when I'm in touch with somebody, I they take on my frequency. And it, it feels like uh, it's too one way. And I yeah, wonder yeah. if that's what meant by it, or yeah, if yeah. maybe the metaphor no, doesn't yeah, fit yeah, as it, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, maybe it's uh, too, too. It, it, I think it goes too too far when you, uh, and that's why I really try to highlight. It's not just the same tune you are in. I mm -hmm. mean, you are tuning into it. I mean, I think this is more interesting. You embark on the topic mm -hmm. of the other, and you mm -hmm. really try to involve yourself. You try to grasp the mood and uh, the the sensing of the other but mm -hmm. this evokes something different in you and yeah. this this difference this being different from the other is i think the thing which really yeah brings the conversation to a new level mm -hmm. and uh, to, to to a new life and you know you understand What you have said as the uh, the coachee or dialogue partner, suddenly you reflect on on this tuning in of the other, mm -hmm. the co-reflection of the other. Yeah, something happens in in, in this uh, situation, and I think this is the interesting point mm -hmm. to really highlight where things rub on each other and really might. Where there are some, you know, yeah. you are also in a struggle with yourself and your own understanding uh, as uh, the dialogue partner. You try to understand yourself in a different way. And mm -hmm. here, this tuning in of the dialogue guide, the coach, is actually uh, mm -hmm. hopefully helpful in it. Mm. I, I think that tuning in is where the magic gets created in when two people get together. And sometimes, Sometimes the coach might change their tune to adjust to who they are meeting. If yeah. somebody is speaking very fast, maybe we speak faster. If somebody is very, very reflective, maybe we're being reflective with them. If yeah. somebody's very cognitive, maybe we meet them on that level. And then we can introduce a different kind of tune and see what it does and what resonates. So I think it's such a fascinating space to pick up on the resonance between our clients and, and us and see yeah. what's happening in that space. I, I mean, you know, you actually remind me of a situation I had uh, recently. I was working, uh, I was having a dialogue with a, a coaching dialogue with a, a, a client and uh, he was speaking very fast and so fast that I couldn't make it to understand him. And I had the idea that he couldn't make it himself. Huh. He could, I mean, he was speaking so fast that he didn't give himself the allowance to really linger in the situation. Mm -hmm. And what I did in this situation, and this was somehow also maybe a kind of slightly different way of resonating. Mm -hmm. I got slower and slower in the way I talked. Mm -hmm. And he said afterwards, this really helped me to get into my thoughts in a new way. Huh. So, so it's not just being <laughs> the same, but being somehow, you know, I mean, I was resonating because mm -hmm. I felt I got breathless. In the way uh, he was speaking, uh -huh. and I resonated in a way that I tried to, you know, slow myself down and help him in this way. Yeah. So by paraphrasing the things we, he said in a very uh, slow way, you know, I tried to slow him down, and mm -hmm. that was my way of resonating to his eager of presenting his case in a very fast. Yeah. Case, uh, which uh, was actually too fast for him and uh, yeah. was clearly too fast for me.
Oh, that's amazing. And this is where I think this Verweilen, this lingering is yeah, right. a good transition to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, could you say a bit more about why that's so important, particularly in the context of, you know, a burnout society and this beschleunigen, this acceleration, uh, the nauseating speed of development on pretty much all fronts? Yeah, I actually, I mean, you mentioned the, the, uh, nearly the title of a, a book, which was my actually my first uh, inspiration, the book, uh, The Burnout Society by a Korean-German philosopher, Bujong Chul Han. So mm -hmm. H-A-N is his uh, surname. And he, uh, he, has, he has actually uh, um, written his uh, doctoral thesis on Heidegger. And, uh, Another Heidegger, existentialist, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, Heidegger uh, created the term of vita contemplativa, which you could translate about as something like the life of lingering or the, the contemplative life. Yeah, okay, contemplative life. Uh, uh, and he used the term verweilen uh, in, in German, which I translated to lingering. And Hahn said, that we really have lost in our times, we have lost to linger. And, uh, and because we always put ourselves in a position, I mean, that, that was his baseline uh, of his book, that we move into a state of where we control ourselves through Uh, permanent uh, ways of documenting things uh, in, in the workplace or we write and to uh, perform ourselves uh, through social media and in this pace we really lose ourselves and this mm -hmm. actually this so in the old days it was actually the boss who controlled our working pace and uh, mm -hmm. performance now we are controlling ourselves through Yeah, self-surveillance. Uh, so in and, and this situation of self-surveillance and self-control, self-controlling, we need a different space to develop, to hinder us to come to this burn, into this burnout uh, uh, position. And here, I mean, uh, Han d doesn't talk about uh, coaching, or, but he speaks about the quality of lingering in dialogue, that this is necessary. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, you know, when I read uh, Han for the first time, I thought, oh, I mean, he is somehow an eye opener for the perspective of how you can, how you need to see transformative dialogues or coaching in our uh, volatile society and uh, our, you know, Accelerate, uh, accelerating society, uh, as uh, uh, Rosa puts it. So mm -hmm. a lot of people speak about this pace, this rush uh, we are in, and we we really lose contact to ourselves. And just you know, we are very much into this performative dimension mm -hmm. of identity, but we are not taking our time to really linger to understand ourselves on a deeper level and this is actually from time to time we really need these spaces mm -hmm. and maybe these spaces we should uh, be able to provide as uh, coaches or other dialogue partners yeah i i really love that and also i want to underline that from time to time because in a world that is moving very fast if we were to linger on everything we would be left behind and that's a mm. fair argument but coaching or dialogue or any reflective space where we allow ourselves to not speed up to actually be there create some space mm. and maybe really think about something or just not think maybe spend some more time in meditation and like really be with something presence is one of those times when we're really present with something we're lingering on that moment yeah. and it takes me back to a very significant relationship i've had in my life with a, a old school friend of mine um who was very much lingering as a personality. <laughs> so, you know, we would sit next to each other, um, you know, spending an evening together and I would ask a question and he would literally linger on the question for five to 10 minutes before he would give me a response. Oh, and at yeah. some point, like my dad was 
quite impatient so i've i've been given that in my in the way that i grew up but this was a such a transformative time of my life to spend time with us uh, with stefan um where we sat there and i learned to linger on something yeah. um with an extreme introvert <laughs> to be fair it yeah. uh, i don't think it helped him in all those situations perhaps entering the workplace but Heck, seeing coaching or di that form of dialogue as a space where we allow ourselves to do that, mm. to create those spaces where we can linger, um, it's of such great value because uh, we don't do that naturally anymore. Mm. Right. So how cool, how do we learn that? I wonder if we could get maybe uh, to to bring the conversation to a close into the kind of practical element. If yeah. if a coach sits out there and says, "Well, I love everything that you guys are talking about," but like, how how do I do that? If a coaching client comes in, maybe you could talk about some some of the practical frameworks or how how a process might look like or on a practical level what can coaches do to create more of that in their coaching conversations i mean the first thing is that you need a lot of self awareness i mean and you try and you really try to get into this mood of uh, witness thinking that you really try to uh, understand and get a really essential uh, grasp on 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 your uh, dialogue partner i think this is the foundation and then of course i mean i'm also inspired by narrative thinking and mm -hmm. uh, there we have this special procedure of outsider witnessing and uh, originally it started very much from a community psychological perspective so in this we can see, i mean i have worked uh, in research wise a lot with groups and I think groups are very good in building a community if they really relate to something but they have maybe specific issues in common and they can relate to each other and the the simplest uh, the most simple way to relate to another person is oh I know what you are talking about mm -hmm. this is the maybe the most basic relationship mm -hmm in regard to uh, being a witness uh, to the other. But sometimes even this comment to something another person has said helps the person who has who have said this really a long way further because often people think that they struggle, they, they are the only human being yeah. in the world who struggles with this issue or problem or something. And then if they suddenly know, oh, I, I know this as well, as mm. you described. I resonate with what you're saying. Right. <laughs> so, so this outsider witnessing procedure is quite helpful. And I try to stretch this uh, more, you know, the, the, the outsider witnessing procedure you know, where I speak about sharing gifts, I use this metaphor uh, here as something to make it a bit more simple. I think this element of sharing gifts, receiving gifts, being aware of what do I really learn from my client. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, if I give this back to my client, the client suddenly knows, oh, I also have some ability some competency some wisdom or whatever uh, the the question is about so and there is already a helpful perspective and if you as a witness and you as the the coach or dialogue guide are the witness for your client and you help the other by reflecting back mm -hmm. by saying th something as i did with uh, this uh, uh, client uh, uh, this morning uh, why i suddenly reminded a situation and this was helpful for the other and so <clears throat> there is no clear you know manual for for this i think what is important is to be a human a fellow human partner mm -hmm. If you take this really serious, that you are a fellow human partner in the dialogue with, of course, the responsibility of being the driver of the conversation or the dialogue as well. 
Mm-hmm. So you have your duty. I mean, you even get paid for this, but you can use yourself as a resource for the other in this uh, ref- uh, reflective uh, or co-reflective space. Mm-hmm. I love that. It, it brings to mind, um, you have a list of 10 commandments, you call them. And when I read commandments, I'm like, oh, oh my God. But then I read them and I just absolutely loved them. And I, I wonder it might be, I would love to read them out. Yeah. If you don't mind. Actually, I have to uh, admit or uh, make you aware about this. They originally come from Eric Dehaan. Right. I love so Eric. I, I, I transformed them a little bit, but I used them and I refer to Eric Dehaan, whom I really uh, are in favor with as a very competent and uh-huh. professional colleague. Yeah, we had them on the podcast. Uh, where Robert talked to him a couple of months ago. Um. Do you, mind, do you mind if I read them? Because I, I think they're just yeah. a wonderful list um, that is very practically oriented. Uh, so it says, first, do no harm. It is better to do too little than to do harm. I think that already helps a lot. Uh, have confidence. As long as you are guided by ethical principles and sincere intentions, you can actually make a difference. Commit yourself, heart and soul, to your approach. Showing commitment, confidence, attachment and loyalty to your approach can make a difference. Read from any missteps and the feedback you receive. Feed the hope of your dialogue partner. Hope is a crucial factor in development and change. Help your dialogue partner to embrace hope. Consider the coaching situation from a dialogue partner's perspective. Your dialogue partner's expectations uh, influence the effectiveness of your relationship. Ask for feedback from your dialogue partner as the process unfolds. Work on your coaching relationship. This is a... When you, when you have a good relationship, there is a good chance that the dialogue will have a positive effect. If you don't click, find a replacement coach. A good match based on mutual trust and respect is the foundation of a fruitful dialogue. Look after yourself to keep yourself as healthy as possible. It seems to make a difference for the positive development of the dialogue that you, as the dialogue guide, appear attractive, competent, stable, healthy, happy, empathic, warm and reliable. Try to stay fresh and unbiased. Rigid procedures and protocols are not helpful, but counterproductive. And lastly, don't worry too much about the specific things you are doing. Uh, Be present in the moment. Use your personal strength and make yourself available as a good conversation partner. Mm. It sums up so much of what I believe is the foundation of good coaching. Yeah, and I have to uh, add here something. I mean, these commandments are actually all Mm evidence-based. They are based on research done. So they are not just come from an expert coach uh, who who gives uh, gives out his uh, knowledge. They are actually the Mm -hmm. result of uh, uh, research in coaching and Mm -hmm. partly also in psychotherapy. If people want to read up on that, uh, Eric writes about them, I think, in his book, Relational Coaching. Yeah, right. And a lot of relational coaching approach seems to resonate a lot. And you're quite evidence-based as well. The Guide to Third Generation Coaching was quite a dense evidence-based book. Mm. So, so in, in that sense, uh, these guidelines, we, we could, should maybe better call them, these guidelines are actually something mm. where, which I also present. I, I, if I teach uh, young coaches, we also discuss them. Uh, mm-hmm. And they give also hope to be able to, to, to do the work as a coach. Yeah. Because, I mean, I think it's not so important how, what, what kind of frame, theoretical framework you have. I think what I'm really uh, a lot focused uh, on is that we really work on this dialogue relationship. The relationship yeah. is actually the, the key for development. Yeah. And this is... Sorry, yeah. you know, it, it takes the weight off for so many coaches who are so f- overly focused on asking the right question at the right time, yeah. you know, for having the right approach or giving themselves the right title or following the right process. Yeah. When actually, when you're in dialogue and you're present and you're a fellow human being and you're in a creative dialogue, that's, that's the foundation of where change is happening. Yeah. And we don't need to be overly focused on the particular approach that we're bringing in. Yeah, right. Sorry, I was interrupting. No, it's uh, it's fine. <laughs> I, re- I resonate a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Um, Reinhard, as we're bringing this to a close, um, is there something else that you would want developing coaches to know about, maybe point them in a direction if they wanted to uh, look up more of these, uh, of these things, dive more into the approach or just any words of wisdom that you wanted to impart? Oh, that puts a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it remains so. an invitation. <laughs> I think the best way to start or uh, to develop yourself is to be yourself in the mm -hmm. dialogue. So I think maybe it's, you know, I grew up uh, or I'm, I was influenced by a very anti-authoritarian time uh, when I was young. I mean, I didn't get, uh, receive an anti-authoritarian education myself, but I lived in a, in a time where these ideas came up. And I think somehow I'm quite, although I try to be an authority now, I try to uh, help people to really believe in themselves and be in the moment with the other. I think this is the most important thing. And use yourself as a kind of, uh, you know, sensory organ to, to, to relate to the other. I think mm -hmm. this is a very good starting point. And then really try to help the other through what you have learned or can learn from the other and what you would like to share from the ideas you get out of the con con conversation. So being a, a, a witness for the other and in that sense, guiding the other in new directions. Hmm. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective today, Reinhard. I really appreciate it. I, I'll say it again. I can't uh, recommend the, the art of dialogue, particularly in coaching enough. Uh, so if people wanted to read more about this, um, witness more of that, be more present. Uh, thank you very much for your perspective. Thank you, Reinhard. My pleasure. Thank you.